proud to be here today. I can't lie, I've been doing this in a while, standing up in front of people, so if you could bear with me, it would, I'd appreciate it. Um, as you've already heard, my name is Justin Morris. I'm 27 years old. I'm working as a teaching assistant in a sexual trauma unit. There's only about 11 students there at the moment. It's a home, it's a school that's connected to the home that I work with, we run a company called Cambia, and they've got small schools that link. So young people who can't go to mainstream school yet, they can actually go there first and then transition from there. Before that, I did work as a support worker for young people in the mental health institute and a therapeutic one as well. And I did that for about two years. In my spare time, I make music about my lifestyle and what I've been through. So I put that up on YouTube, SoundCloud, things like that. And I've also started a company called Diverted Root Limited, which is on my t-shirt. We've got merchandise that we're selling that promotes positivity in the community. So um, that's just a bit about me. Um, growing up, my relationship with my parents was good. My mum and my dad was married until I was about five years old and then they got divorced. And even though they got divorced, it was still a, it was still a good relationship. I'd see my dad every holiday, like the holidays or six weeks holidays. We'd see him for three weeks and six weeks or every other weekend. And he was a hard working man. So it was, it was a good relationship that we had. And it was a great relationship to, I'd say, about 15, and I'm one of three children. So I've got an older brother who's five years older than me, and I've got a little sister who's five years younger. My older brother got locked up when I was 15 for what we call the stretch. It was a long time, double figures. So that kind of brought my whole family dynamic down because, as you can imagine, as I parents for their first child to end up incarcerated for such a long time they started to really break down you know my mum seemed like she'd given up and my dad was he had found a new girlfriend and she had her own family and I started to feel like they saw him more than me so I kind of started to take that to heart and I went to I was a good kid at school and I got all my grades and stuff but I started to turn to the streets and I started to kind of get angry after, after that and I started taking it out on people and me and my dad used to get into fights, like physical fights. I started handling weapons and things, things that I wasn't proud of but he'd see me and try and stop me from getting involved and it's like as the dynamic had broken down I started to lose like the morals and standards that I'd grown up so you know like to respect your parents and things like that. I got to the, stage where I was I wasn't respecting them no more, I'd argue, I'd say things, like we fighting, it was it was getting to that point. So after we got to that point there, me and my dad got to a point where we didn't talk for about two, three years. And every time we saw each other there was an issue. And I got to the point where I'd spend a lot of time with his friends and they were positive role models for me personally because they although I found out later on in the line that not all of them was on the best of paths they never let me see that that side of them so it's only when I got to about 17, 18 I could read papers and things about them where I could say well I didn't think that person had got involved in this or you wouldn't think that was the type of person you was around but they kept they always promoted positivity to me which I respected and I had come across a few of them who would even show me things like stab wounds, gunshot wounds, and they'd say, listen, like, you want to be a bad boy? If you want to be a bad boy, this is what happens to bad boys, you know what I mean? And they kind of let me know that I wanted to grow up and be somebody else, but they were showing me you don't need to be like that, to the point where they would say, look at us now, we was gangsters, we was, you know, dripping in gold, we had all the money we wanted. Half of them ended up in prison for like 12 to 15 years. About three quarters of them ended up in like warehouse jobs and things like that later on down the line where they would show me and they would say, look, we're, we're in warehouse jobs now. The same people who was robbing banks and things like that and had all this type of money. But look at us now, we're not nothing like that. So they're saying, it's not going to last basically. 
and they wanted to promote that to me, which I respected because what I see these days with young people is, especially with my generation, I feel like we're actually encouraging the young people to do bad and get them involved. I watched a program the other day where it was saying that um, people around my age group was sending young people to a place where they say called Kunch, which is like basically where they sell drugs and things like that. And it made me realise how the world's actually changed because in my day we had people who was doing bad things but they wanted you to do good. Now it's, we've got people our age who want to see people do bad and they'll break down their own community to do that. Like why would you be selling drugs in your own even at all, not even just in your own community, why would you be selling drugs to people that you love and that you care about and seeing them deteriorate in front of you while your pocket got bigger? So I started to see a lot of things and it got to the point where after they had spoke to me about all of this, I sat down with my own, um, I finally got time to sit down with my dad and we built the relationship back and we started talking, blessing. And um, we just got to the point where I realised I didn't want to do this stuff anymore and I started, I, the things I was doing I started to feel guilty about doing and I wanted to keep myself away from it but it was hard because the friends that I had now made, they didn't accept that, they wanted me to still be the person we would all be in the streets, so that was hard work for me, I lost a lot of friends, I lost a lot of people around me, but when I went back to my dad and I told him, I said listen I'm finding my feet now and I sort my life out. And it was like, this is great. So we worked on that. My sister was getting baptized at the time. And it interested me because I thought, you know, I want to start again. I've done a lot of bad things now. I actually want to start again now. So in this time, I was planning to go to Africa because I was volunteering to work in schools and universities. There was a project with ICS, Restless Development and you'd go abroad for 12 weeks and you'd live in a host home and you'd get to know the culture and then you'd go and deliver um, classes to students in the school. So I told my dad I was going to be going here and he was one of the only people who really believed in what I was doing because as you know, after my mum, she was scared so her automatic response was you don't need to go all the way to Africa to change the world. You can stay here. We've got loads of projects around here. She ran my auntie. My auntie ran my phone. You can move to London. You can do a project up here and all these things. And I was like, I want to go to Africa. I really believed that I was told to go there. So I raised the money. We had to raise 800 pounds to um, go there through um, things in the community, like cake sales and things like that. But I just did like normal fundraising events. And I managed to raise the money and my dad was the last person I've seen in England before I went to, well I say Birmingham, before I went to Heathrow Airport, I went to Africa and while I, while I was there, best time of my life, I can't lie, but I saw some things that really changed my life. I realised that I was taking a lot for granted and there's people that really are going through much worse than I was going through. So it was a real, real eye opener for me and I was living the life, I was having a great time and then three days before I was coming home, I'll never forget it because well, I'll never forget it in a way. But before I went to Africa, my dad told me to take two memory cards for my camera because we was going to be um, I was filming like a music video and a documentary and stuff while I was there. And he says to me, um, I brought the one, I'll never forget he goes to me, um, take two memory cards. And I was like, why? He goes, it's just best to have an extra one just in case, you know what I mean? You're gonna catch your everything that you want to capture. Now the day my memory card um, ran out, I was filming a video and I headed home. To, I spoke to the man, I said I'm going to go home, I'm going to delete some footage, I'm going to come back in the morning and carry on with this video. So like, that's fine. Something made me go home that day because when I got back to my host family's home, as soon as I sat on my bed, my phone rang and it was my little sister and she was crying and she was like, Dad's dead. And I was like, how? Like, I don't understand what's, how this has all happened. Because I've been in Africa for about 11 weeks and three days at this point. So my course literally just finished. And um, I was thinking, my head was everywhere at the time. Because I couldn't get my head around. I'd spoken to him about two days before. 
he sounded quite healthy, you know, and um, he actually died of coronary heart disease, so he died in his sleep basically, and my sister had to go to the house, he didn't turn up to work, so my sister turned up to the house to see if he was there, and she had to find him with my granddad, and then obviously I'm in Africa at the time, my older brother's in prison, he's still in prison now to this day, so we was all away, she was on her own to deal with the situation, and it, it was hard work, it was hard work because I had to stay in Africa for three more days because my flight had already been booked, so they couldn't change it. It was an 18 hour flight, two planes, so I had to stay there because I would have to come back on my own and they didn't want to leave me in that state on my own either, so I ended up coming back that way. And when I come home, I realised, like, I started looking at my life because everyone who was around started saying, we worry now, you're going to relapse, you're going to go back to what he was doing before because, you know, he was involved in negative things but you turned away from him because he was getting on track and now you've just lost. My dad was the first person I ever lost, so, who was close to me. So, they expected me to just spiral out of control again and it's crazy because I'd been baptised and I didn't know that, I didn't know the strength of baptism if that makes sense. I really thought I was going to come back. I used to really heavily drink alcohol and heavily smoke marijuana and I was quite a violent person, you know what I mean? And people just expected this to come back out of me. But when I come home, it's, it's mad that even alcohol, I remember sitting there at Christmas time because my dad died the 16th of December. So it was like a week before Christmas. So it was a time where there was a lot of alcohol. There was a lot of, you know, family members around. There was a lot of emotion. And I didn't even want to drink, and I didn't understand why I didn't want to drink. And I was like, this is a perfect time to wash away my feelings. Mm -hmm. But I felt that God didn't want me to do that, because he had a bigger plan for what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to carry on with what I need to do. His friends would tell me things like, he was so proud of you when you went to Africa. He was boasting about you to everybody, and my son's going to change the world, and things like that. And I looked up to that, and that made me proud. So when I came home, it's things like that I looked at to say, I'm not going to throw all of this away now because you was the last person I spoke to in England and you believed in me when no one else believed in me yeah. and now I'm coming home, I want give, to give something back to the young people so I came back and it was, it was a lot of hard work but I finally found myself into a job I was mourning a lot so I'd still be having breakdowns I was taking a lot of time off work and I just didn't think I was getting anywhere. But then I started to really believe, and I had to keep believing in my head. He believes in what I was doing. He really wants to see me go far. So I carried on doing what I was doing. I was designing this logo when I was in Africa. And I had the vision before I went to Africa that I was going to do this. But I said to my dad, when I get home, I'm going I'm to start my own clothing label. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my music. And he was like, yeah, I believe you, I, I, I want to see you do this. So when I came home, I started to look at life like that. And instead of mourning, I started looking at things like the positive side of it. I started thinking, okay, you've died, but you've unlocked so much inside me now. Because I really believe, like, I believe in myself more than ever. I was a very, low, I had low confidence in my life. And I used to kind of, peer pressure was, used to get the better of me, shall I say. But I started to really stand on my own two feet and believe and from the teachings that my dad's friends had gave me as well it made me realise I'm growing up now to be a man I've got a daughter on the way um, she's due in about seven weeks God's willing my first child I've never had a kid before and um, it made me realise that I've, things that I need to look out for things that I should do and what I shouldn't do me and my dad have fallen out because of he had a new relationship with a new, another woman and I felt like I was getting pushed out. But as I grew up, I realised it wasn't that. He still had the time for me. But my anger was clouding that time for the relationship. So I had to go through all of these things to realise that how important a father-son relationship is. Because what I'm doing now, 90% of it is due to my dad. Because if it wasn't for him dying, honestly, as bad as that sounds, I don't think I would have done half the things I'm doing now. Because he gave me a different look at life, you know what I mean, I started to realise different things, so I brought up, I started the, um, the clothing brand, I linked up with a 
team of people called People Power UK in Birmingham. They work with knife crime, um, suicide, drug, drug addiction, and things like that. So we've all started to put heads together. We've got a lot of young people that we're working with. And I've only just joined them about a week ago, but they started to really help me put things into perspective. So going forward, it got to the point where what, what I'm really trying to get to is, if you take anything from this speech, is that the relationship with my dad wasn't always the best, but it was important no matter what, because I've learned manners, morals, respect, even things like just saying my grace at, at before, my, before my dinner, mm -hmm. things that I was taught from a young child, you know what I mean? Like, from working in the, the work that I work in, I've learned that at the age of one to three, they said, at a training I was at the other day, is an important time for kids to take in certain things, for it to stick and for them to grow and to be able to develop properly. And that's made me realise now that where the focus has gone wrong for a lot of people, I've got a lot of young friends who have kids, I've got friends who don't see their kids, they choose not to. And it really, it really affects my mind to think that why would you not be there for your own child? That's part of you, you know what I mean? Obviously not always the circumstances that easy. I know people who have had a, woman, a baby with somebody who won't let them see their child and there's heartache there and there's a child growing up then that's in already a dysfunctional family. So I see a lot of dysfunction where I'm from and that's what made me really feel like no one's doing what I'm trying to do right now in my community because there wasn't trying to reach the people of how I was trying to reach them, how I believed. I thought everyone's got their different way of reaching people. I was more connected to the streets than so. So I felt like I still had respect in certain communities that I could talk to certain young people. And I'd have certain young people that believed in what I was doing. I was making music projects. I had young people saying to me like, listen, we were selling, we were selling drugs on the streets. We started listening to your music and we started to realize we're going to change our life. And that stuff started to empower me. But going through the loss of my dad, I'd have breakdowns and I'd have times where I wasn't functioning. And in that time, I'd see things like the same young people I was working with ending up back in prison because I've fallen off. So I'm not keeping consistent and they're thinking, well, it's not working for you. Why is it going to work for me? Yeah. And that's what I started to realise. Like, I have to be consistent with what I'm doing. I need to get up. I need to keep trying to change the world. I keep, need to yeah. keep giving my speeches. And I haven't done a speech before since Africa, so it's been about four years standing up in front of people, but I feel like God sent me to do these things yeah. because I've, it's in my head, it's in my knowledge and I've gone through it, you know what I mean? Like I've gone through the hard times with my, with my parents and I've saw now that there's so many young people growing up without proper role models and if they're not going to at least have a parent to do it, then I want to be the person who can help, that's why I do the job that I do, I'll do support work because I'll be that next person to help you like get your mind right. The little things that you do, you probably don't think change and it probably is going to take you about six years to see one change actually take place with some of the young people you work with. But you, you, you get in there and it's the building of getting there that really made me feel like I was meant to do this. And ever since I got baptised, like I said, I've, um, I've washed away a lot of things that I was doing. I've now, naturally, I don't like to drink and things like that. I'm still working on smoking smoking and things like that, but Rome wasn't built in a day. I believe that God's working on me every single day. Yeah. When I first went to church yeah. and I was getting baptised, I felt that people says, well, um, come in here, God's going to accept you as you are. But then as I go through the services, people would say to me things like, well, God loves you, but you can't drink, you can't smoke, you can't have sex, you can't do this. And what I've realised is, you slowly start seeing the young people just start coming because they started to think it was too forced onto you. It's like people were saying, you have to do this now. It's took me a while to stop doing things that I've done. But I know that God's given me that time. You know what I mean? Because it's not going to happen overnight. So every day I make something, I take one step that gets me a bit closer, if you know what I mean? So that's been really important to me. And that's what I want to share to the young people because I come from a bad, I come from a bad place, and I'm just trying to make the best out of the bad place I come out of. You know what I mean? And I convert the pain that I've gone through now. I go through a lot of pain. I still have my breakdowns. I still cry. I still have days I don't want to go to work. But 
this is bigger than me now, that's the way I look at it, it's bigger than me, I need to help the other people, I need to help these young people, I'm seeing the young people I work with now at the school show me, when you hear the things you hear at my job, with the type of life and the trauma that these young people have gone through, you have to give thanks that it wasn't yourself, and then you have to give thanks that you've now got the knowledge to want to give something back and change this life for another young person to not go through that. Because I've heard some horrific stories working in the support work sectors and in the teaching assistant system work. And that's made me really come here today. I feel like God made me come here today. I was very nervous to come here and you can probably tell how I'm talking, I'm quite nervous because mm -hmm. I haven't spoken for a while but I felt like I was meant to do this, so I hope that you can take something yeah, from what I've given you today. Mm -hmm. God bless everyone. Thank you.